Would you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2? I sense a bit of leftover anointing from the women's conference. I don't know, Sherman, Hugo, you're feeling it. I'm feeling it. God is good and touching lives. Um, grateful for all who were a part of the women's conference. I want to say thank you to all the people who served. There were many who served in front of the scenes and even more that served behind the scenes. Shout out to Sherman. You guys did the parking lot late on Friday when it was freezing cold. So Sherman, we give you a hand uh, for that service and are so grateful for you. And the ladies that came from our Hugo campus, thank you so much for investing in that. A sense breakthrough, I saw many things uh, that, that were just coming off of people's lives. Um, I tuned in online. There wasn't a, a rule that men couldn't tune in online, and so I got to watch it and uh, got to take care of four of my children while my wife got to lead, and that was exhausting but exciting. Uh, my love and appreciation for my wife is just, just never ends. It's so good. All right, we are going to jump into um, the Word and, and I am concluding this particular series on the presence of God. I'm far from done talking about the presence of God um, because I, I, I don't know how to carry this conviction um, without just continually talking about it. And it's going to leak into not just sermons, but just, uh, just everything that, that I see going on, just a conviction that truly we need the presence of God like never before. And as much as I want us to fight for truth, and I think we must fight for truth, um, and as much as I think we should fight for morality and a strong Christ-like ethic, I, I believe that. It's got to be necessary. There has to be a people who put their foot in the ground when it comes to truth and goodness and morality in this world. However, if that is the only place we put our feet or we put our foot in the ground, eventually we just become mean-spirited, self-righteous religious people if we don't have the presence of God. And I want to give more than just truth or just ethic to my children, though not less than that. The more I want to give them is a true encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, a life lived in his presence because his presence is not disassociated from his mission, and that includes you. And today, I'm building on what I began last week, just talking about uh, how important you are when it comes to the presence of God and the mission of God. And I want each of you, not just the you know, super spiritual, um, I want each of you to recognize how important you are in wherever you are, in whatever your life is, how important you are to God's mission in this world. And so... Um, We'll begin in Ephesians 2, but kind of to, to, to build back what I, what I shared last week, just again, uh, trying to see this from a, a holistic biblical lens, that I don't want you to be intimidated by your Bible. And as a pastor, I truly want you to see all that's in your scriptures, um, because it, it, it does communicate to us the powerful Word of God, uh, and it is transformative. Um, but it's also intimidating. It's also weird at times and strange in some places and confusing in a lot of places. And so, yes, I want, I want you to see this from a holistic biblical lens. Um, so last week, we kind of traced this idea of God's presence through the tabernacle, through the temple, and in God's people. And so to kind of just layer out just a few groundwork things, one, the image of God, the image of God that humans are from Genesis 1 26 through 28, how God made man in his image and after his likeness and let them have dominion. And that means representation and rule. God wants his people, God wants humans to be in charge of the world, but not disconnected from him. And so he makes man in his image and that it bearing his image necessitates his presence, necessitates a personal presence with the Lord and interaction with his presence. It requires a relationship. But it does mean that we as humans are called to represent the character of God into the world. And it means that he gave us dominion. He gave us authority in this world. And we just did terrible with it. Uh, and that's the nature of sin. Sin makes us stupid. It makes us make all sorts of poor, selfish decisions. And, and so God calls a people 
And in Exodus 19, God called the people of Israel and gave them the human vocation of bearing his image. And it's phrased in Exodus 19 that they are to be a kingdom of priests. That's the vocation of the people of God, to be a kingdom of priests. And Israel did terribly with this. And so you fast forward all the way to Jesus. Jesus is in person and in human what God always intended temples and tabernacles to be. The temples and tabernacles were just signposts headed in the direction of Jesus being the reality of what all of those were pointing to. So Jesus being the new temple then inhabits his people. And so the dwelling place of God is no longer a place. It's not a tabernacle or temple. It's not a physical location. It is a people. It is a people made new in Christ Jesus. We are the dwelling place of God. And every dramatic, crazy thing we see happening in the tabernacle or temple where heaven has invaded earth and God's presence is dwelling now is in you. It is in you and with you. And it, is, and it might not feel as dramatic as you read in Exodus 40 or 1 Kings 8 or 2 Chronicles 7. It might not feel as dramatic as sometimes you see those temple stories um, showing, but it is no less true and real. So the dwelling place of God is with his people. And that's what we looked at the, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So to build on that though, I want you to see the necessity to belong to the people of God. That we, we man, a really tough thing in scripture as it relates to how we understand this in culture is um, the, the, the connected nature between the individual and the community. And uh, your Bible was written in the midst of an honor-shame culture uh, where the grid of the culture was just honor-shame and you don't bring shame on your family. And so it was very communal where the identity was in the community and the family. The family and the community made up a person's identity and the, the individual could not get detached from that community lest there be shame. Um, and in our culture, it's totally flipped where we, we sort of um, idolize the individual and, and we're so hyper-individualistic that we don't see a need for a people. And that's where now culture has poisoned the idea of community because it's trying to meet a legitimate need to belong to a people. But, but now it's at the expense of the individual. And so somehow we're gonna have to just walk through what this means to, to be both an individual and a community and how those work together. That, that you are a person, an individual, and you're responsible for you. You're responsible before God for you as an individual, but it's not disconnected from a family and a community. And so somehow we're gonna have to work through this together. So when, I, when I'm talking about belonging to a community, I'm not talking about losing who you are in Christ and who you are before the Lord. But, but, but because we're so been hyper-focused on individualism, I'm gonna emphasize the community a little bit more today. So we have to see that the dwelling place of God isn't just me, it's we. That, that it is, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That the God of the universe does not think residing in you is a degradation of his nature. He finds your body a worthy temple of his presence. That's powerful, but it's also connected to a people, not just a person. You don't have the fullness of God's presence. You don't have the fullness of his grace. You don't have the fullness of his spirit. We, his people, have the fullness of his spirit. You have a part of that. And so I want you to see how important this is with us being connected because of us being connected together is how God's mission is fulfilled. Okay, so Ephesians 2 um, with every scripture, you just kind of have to start somewhere. And when it comes to Ephesians, it's important to read the entire book because <laughs> all, all of his ideas and points are all connected to each other. Uh, but we got to start somewhere. Ephesians chapter two, I'm just going to start in verse 19, um, where Paul is talking about the Gentiles being a part of God's family, which was understood at that time to only be Israel. And Paul is making a claim that now it's about Christ, Christ Jesus, that both Jew and Gentile now become one family. 
And since I would say the vast majority of us are Gentile, he's talking directly to us. Um, Chapter 2, verse 19 of Ephesians. Now, therefore, you, and that you in Greek is plural, so it's an appropriate translation to say y'all. We're all redneck enough that that makes sense. Now, therefore, y'all together, not just you individually, but y'all together, y'all are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens uh, with the saints and members of the household of God. You're a citizen of God's kingdom with every right to the title and term saint as anybody who's lived an extra holy life. Because it's not about you and your holiness, it's about Christ and his holiness. You're a citizen with all the saints and a member of the household of God. In Christ, you have a new family. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You're not in it yourself. You're not in it on some ideology. Your identity is not shaped by a culture or a philosophy or an ideology. It's built on a person, and that person is Jesus Christ, who isn't just a historical figure. He's also a living person, the king of the universe, who's taken up residence inside of you. In whom, in Christ, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So not only are you a citizen, you're also a family member, and you're also a building. And that building has a bunch of different pieces and parts. And you can look at each individual piece or part and say something about that piece or part, but you're not gonna call that piece or part a building. When it is assembled, it is a building. Okay, we're, we're building a building, and we just ordered a steel package. It's going to take forever to get here, but we're not going to call the individual pieces of steel that are going to be delivered on trucks a building. It's a part of a building. When it's assembled, it'll be a building. You're a piece, a critical and important piece But there's a whole building being built and it requires being fitted together. And as it's being fitted together, it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. What you and I experience at an individual level, though awesome, is only a foretaste of what it's like to be assembled together and growing into a holy temple. And whatever assembly we have now has room to grow. Not just with more people, but your growth. Your growth and experience of his presence affects the whole growth of the whole temple. And not just in one location, in in all of our locations. And then verse 22, in whom, this is all about Jesus, all about Jesus, in whom y'all also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. You can go to Acts chapter one just a couple verses there. But here we see that as as the God of the universe has taken up residence in each person, when each person is fitted together, belonging to a family and a community, it is by Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit that, that, that each piece is being fitted together pieced together. And as each piece is being fit together, it's growing into what? A holy temple. You're already a holy temple. So you see the the kind of the paradox here. That means that whatever habitation or dwelling place of the Holy Spirit we've experienced now is nothing compared to what it can be and what it can grow to. So our, and this is, this is where I will risk sounding um, that I have selfish intent here. I do not. But if I can't convince you of that just by saying it, then there's probably no convincing you anyway. This is why it is necessary. It's not just a good idea. It's not just helpful. It's not just if you can fit it in your schedule. 
it is necessary to belong to a church. Amen. And, I, and, 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 and this is just so I can just a little, this is not fine print, I'll just say it clearly. If it ain't this church, belong to a church. I don't care at this point. I like this church. I think it's a good church. I, yeah, that's like I, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, but, but you have to belong to a church. Why? Is it because that's going to affect your ticket to heaven? No, not at all. You're fine. If that's all you're in it for, fine. You're living a way shallow existence in the Christian life. But you know what? Okay. But if you want more, if you know there's more, if you know that there's an experience of God that you haven't tapped into yet, it is going to be with a people. It's not going to disconnect you from the responsibility to cultivate a personal relationship with God. That's why you are a temple of his Holy Spirit and you are responsible for cultivating a personal relationship with the Lord. However, that is not the full extent of what it means to live in and from God's presence. You need to be fitted together with a people. And this is where I, yeah, this is also, I'm just gonna take another risk. Um, I am for technology, okay? I think that there has to be churches who engage in technology as a mission field to bring people to Jesus. We do it, and I think it's necessary. It's critical to continuing to reach people. However, there is a potential risk when it comes to doing everything we do as a church digitally. And the risk is people assume that just because I'm watching, I'm belonging. And there are, there are many people, let me just, give me, give me the close-up camera right here because I need to talk to, to everyone who's digital, okay? Um, those who engage online. There are many things that necessitate you engaging with the church online, okay? So did you hear me say that? I don't know, you type yes in the chat. There are many things that necessitate Engaging with the church digitally. Watching services are only one tiny, tiny little fragment. You have to have community. You have to have community. And if you have to use technology as a means of community, do so. My problem is not with those who have to use those methods. My problem comes with people who use those methods as an excuse to not engage in community but assume you're engaging in community just because you watch sermons. That's what I have a problem with, and that's, and that's a risk that I'm even saying that. Um, but this, this was my big rub with, with COVID. Not only do we have a rub with the enemy seems to be taking ground and we're just not gonna have it, we're gonna be continuing to be a praying church that sees the miraculous and sees people set free, and then walk people through all sorts of ups and downs in life and grieving and all those things, all, all for that. But, but I w I'm, I'm fighting the temptation for the, what, what the gravitational pull is from that was to use technology as the sole mediator of all relationship. And, and that I'm not okay with. Uh, and people use excuses to not gather. There are legitimate reasons, and I'm not gonna finger point at anybody to say, oh, that's an excuse. No, no, let the Lord convict you on that. But we have a command from the Lord, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And it's not so we get good church attendance numbers. It's not because you need to check that, that box on your religious meter of holiness. I attended church this week, check. It's because your connection and belonging to a community, yes, in the gathering of the church, but beyond the gathering, in small groups, in, in all sorts of relationships that get cultivated, it affects the temple. Not the building, the physical structures. It affects the dwelling place of God when you're not belonging to a community of faith. It affects the, the maturing of a people into the full temple that God wants his people to be. And that's not going to be in physical places, it's in tight-knit community. 
And we gather on Sunday because, well, Jesus was raised on a Sunday and the church has done it ever since Easter Sunday. Like, I'm not gonna be one to break that. We got a long streak going. It's almost 2,000 years. So, like, I'm not gonna break that streak. But it, 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 it necessitates you being here as much as humanly possible. And that's going to sound self-serving. And it's not so that we can chalk up better numbers on stat sheets. It's because it affects your experience of God's presence. And this is why this is important, not so that you feel good on a Sunday and can make it through Monday to Saturday. Acts chapter one. We already looked at Acts chapter two, but look at what came before that in Acts one. Acts chapter one, verse four. Four. This is the disciples with Jesus. And being assembled together. Assembled together with them, that being Jesus and the disciples, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said... You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And we looked at when that happened last week in Acts chapter 2. I'll show you one verse or a couple verses in that Acts again. But, but, but look at how he says that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then look at verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, There is a difference between me drinking water and swimming in water. Drinking water is important for my hydration right? I'm unhealthy if I don't drink water. But if I drink water or don't drink water, you probably will not know the difference. Outside of maybe like my skin being flaky and dry and my lips being dry. I mean, you won't be able to, you probably won't be able to notice the difference. So me drinking water is for me. But there's a difference in water being upon me. That's noticeable, right? Right? And in the same way, baptized in water, that's water upon you. The Holy Spirit is in me for me so that I'm properly nourished by the presence of God and in relationship with Jesus. But the Holy Spirit is upon me for you to be witnesses. I need the power to be a witness that just my personal relationship with God, it's helpful, it could be, it's, it's necessary because the fruit of the Spirit that happens in the cultivation of relationship with the Lord does work its way out. But I need some power because I will readily admit up against all that is against us between the world, the flesh, and the devil, I am pretty powerless on my own. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit in me, that's for me. The Holy Spirit in you is for you. And dear Lord, you need that. And if you get nothing else, get that. And anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord has been born again. And the very spirit of God resides on the inside of you. You are an appropriate, because you've confessed Jesus, you are an appropriate temple for God's holy presence. And it's in you so that you can live a transformed life but you also need the Holy Spirit upon you because it isn't about you anymore. And I would say maturity into Christ-likeness, one of your major thresholds in life is the many times, not just one time, the many times you come to the realization it ain't about you, Hot Rod. (laughs) Think about what we try to teach our children that is maturity as an adult. It ain't about you. And then as adults, we then become children before the Lord 
and need to grow up as well and be reminded it ain't about you. There is a desperate and hurting world that needs the power of God that should be upon each of us. And being assembled together affects our, let me make a a practical statement, not a theological statement. Being assembled together and engaging in the presence of God affects our baptism. So, okay, just because I have to make sure I make a theologically correct statement. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you only need that once. Okay? You need it once. But we leak. We dry off. Life and trouble and busyness and hardship and turmoil makes us dry off. And it's not that you need new hands laid on you and you get a new prayer language. It's not that. It's that you need to get wet again. And you need the people of God for that. You need the Spirit on them to get on you. Jesus is the one who gets the Spirit in you. But it's Jesus in others through the power of the Holy Spirit that gets on you. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 is that pouring out. But if you follow the story even in Acts... They keep, they keep getting assembled, and guess what? They get fresh filling. It's not that they needed a new day of Pentecost. It's that they leaked. They, they exerted the power of God and saw lives transformed, and guess what? They got a little drained, and they needed refreshed. They didn't need binging Netflix to feel better. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit that was on each other. So Acts chapter 2, look at it in the New King James. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So even our campuses, I mean, just like I've got no problem this message being mediated through technology. I think it's powerful and awesome. But there's a reason why you're gathered in a place with one accord is the Holy Spirit is present in that way that I think is extremely difficult if you're just, quote, watching the content later. Because I I hear that. I I get it. I get it. Nobody's favorite is a video message. I don't think anybody says, I just really hope it's a video today. (laughs) It's like, why do we do it? It's because I still, it's not the same thing. And we've heard, we've heard it said, You've heard it said, (laughs) if it were just going to watch a message, I could watch it at home. I get it. I get it. And if you said it, I mean no condemnation. You're just wrong. (laughs) It's okay to be wrong. Being wrong doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means you're wrong. Because you can't receive the spirit that's on your neighbor right next to you. Like, how are you getting, how, how, like, what, there's far more going on in a service than just what happens from a platform or a video screen. Yes. And you, even where you're at, Hugo, Sherman, you are being, you are dwelling together, being assembled together with one accord, one purpose, which is to lift up the name of Jesus. That's the one accord. Jesus is present and reigning and ruling. And we worship him and we honor him. And because of that, People's lives are being transformed. And that's not just a message. That's the presence of God, not just the scriptures taught by someone. We need to be assembled. We need to be of one accord in one place. Like, we need to make church attendance great again. Again, it's not, it's not because, I, I, I get it, you got a busy schedule, but you're going to make time for what's important to you. And if the presence of God is important to you, if the people of God are important to you, you make time for it. Every busy family is going to have to make choices as to what's important. 
And at some point, someone in the family is going to have to say, the presence of God is a non-negotiable priority for this family. And, I, and I, be, I believe what it's going to take to pass the faith down to our children requires more than just godly parents. Now, you're responsible as parents for the, for the raising of your children, but my goodness, would we not want some help? And the church is intended to be the help, not just kids' services, the church. And let me just make it crystal clear. I don't, we don't say this often. It's just implied, but like... Your children are 100% welcome in this service. Do not feel like you have to keep your kids from being child, from being children, um, and you just push them away or that they're unwelcome or them making some noise in a service. That does not quench the Holy Spirit, okay? If some, if some well-meaning, charismatic preacher told you that, they're absolutely wrong, okay? A crying baby means life. I dread the day there's not crying children in our services. That means there's no life. So kids talking, guess what? They're children. You should be around our dinner table. Our children are very much children. Our children need the spirit that's on each other, not just on the kids' pastor. Amen. Thank you. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, man. So much that I think, this is why we belong to a church is because there's just so much to know, to grow in, to mature in. Uh, there's just, there's a, there's a whole, this, this, this comes, this message today comes from, um, just as much conviction as I have about the presence of God, I have the same level of conviction about what it means to be priests of the Lord. And so this is just barely, barely scratching the surface of what all is there. I just want to keep it in context to the presence of God because we'll have to pick some of these ideas up in another time and in another way. Um, but how important you are. Like why belonging to a church, goodness, it affects more than you can possibly imagine. Belonging to a good church, let me qualify that. Like belonging to a dead church, you'll just stay dead. I, but that is not any one of our campuses, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't usually think about that. But again, if, if, if this isn't your church, find a good church. Dear Lord, find a good church. You absolutely need it for you walking in the fullness of what God has for you. And, and just attending, but gathering together is just the tip of the iceberg of all of what it means to belong to a community of faith that is in it for a lifetime and for generations. Like our church is in this for generations. And every gathering, every small group, every conference, every seminar, everything matters to see, seeing the faith passed down from generation to generation and all of us growing in what it means to be a temple, what it means to be the dwelling place of God by the Spirit that is both you and us. It's both you as an individual and we together as a church. First Peter chapter two. Let me just read a couple verses. So, so keep Ephesians two in your mind, and if you're a Bible study type person that's gonna like trace all these scriptures and dig deeper, you wanna keep these in close connection and read kind of the larger context between Ephesians 2 and 1 Peter 2. Um, but just a couple verses from 1 Peter 2, and I'm gonna read in the New Living Translation. 1 Peter 2, verse four. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Remember, God's dwelling place is not a place, it's a people. And the people are built on a singular foundation, Christ Jesus himself. This is all about Jesus. Our lives and our gatherings and our small groups and our serving is all anchored on the foundation of Christ Jesus himself. That's why we give our lives to just knowing Jesus more and more. 
or just radically obsessed with Jesus. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And so the next verse is connected to that verse. So what it says about Jesus now is connected to what's said next. And you are living stones. In, in a way, Jesus being the temple is connected to you. You are living stones. And that's a plural you. Y'all. Y'all are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more? You are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. <laughs> the reason why we grow as a temple is because you are already a priest. You called upon the name of the Lord, you're his priest. So the question is, how well are we priesting him? Or what are we priesting? It's the same thing. So, think, so connect the idea of being a priest of the Lord to bearing his image. Don't disassociate those. There are two ways of talking about one big idea, representation and rule. You, you are his temple, which immediately says you're his priest. That means you represent Jesus, which is why the world is quick to point out any of our hypocrisy. Any failed Christian leader is gonna get 10 times the coverage as any failed leader of any other religion or politics. We're quick to excuse the failures of secular politician leaders, but man, oh man, Christian leaders, anyone with any prominence, let's just put broadcast that front and center because the world would, do, would love to do nothing more than to shame Jesus by shaming his people. And then we can go like, well, guess what? We're just humans like everybody else. Imperfect. And that's totally true. The problem actually with the church in America, so let me qualify that. So those around the globe, I don't know if, if, if the church globally is the same. It, the church in America as a whole, we are cannibals. We eat our own. We're quick to point out the heretic and call it defending the faith. We're quick to point out the moral failures of, you know, megachurch pastors, but, but excuse the moral failures of the small church pastors. We're cannibals. We just eat each other. We have a better theology of grace than a culture of grace. There's people who can give you all the different theolo theological fine points of grace and yet are the most mean-spirited, unforgiving, self-righteous people. So we're priests. It's just, what are we priesting? And it just is, it's like, I don't know how to explain the kind of burn in my soul for us to truly understand it. It's like, I'm convinced that if you'll just See it. If you'll just get it, just a taste of it, it'll transform the way you think. And I don't know how to do it, except just keep drilling the scriptures at you. <laughs> like, you don't have to have a ministry position to be his priest. You are his priest. You don't have to be a pastor to shepherd people. You're a priest. You're already a priest, which means you need to be so familiar with his presence that you cannot help but priest his presence wherever you go, which is why you don't just need the Holy Spirit in you, you need the Holy Spirit upon you. Because wherever you go, you are a priest. If you're gonna priest the Holy Spirit, if you're gonna priest Jesus, you need his Holy Spirit upon you to witness of him with power. We need to be priests of power. There needs to be more than clever terminology or insecure Nothingness. Oh, we don't, we don't want to be, we don't want to be mean spirited. I'm not going to witness because I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Oh, goodness. We already are priests. Can we be priests with power? So, so listen, listen. You are a spiritual temple.
that needs to grow and mature, okay? If your family needs Jesus, you are the priest to bring him into your family. If your work environment needs Jesus, you are the priest who bring his presence and his power into that environment. We can complain about the culture. We can complain about the school systems. You can complain about the economy. You can complain about the politics all you want, and you and I are doing nothing by our complaining. Zero effect. Your complaining, my complaining has zero effect. My anxiety about all those problems has zero effect except the negative one on me. You want to save our country, save the world, save your family, save the city, be a priest. And you and I are going to struggle being priests when we're in it for ourselves, by ourselves. Verse nine, just bonus. You're not like the people, so you need to read the verses in between verse five and verse nine to talk about the people that rejected Jesus. You're not like that. You are a chosen people. Doesn't matter what you feel like. You're a chosen people. You've been chosen by God. You have been chosen by God. You know, God saw fit to choose you to be a vessel of his salvation for your world. You are royal priests. It's not something you have to attain to. It's something you are. You're a holy nation. We can talk about our country all we want, but are we being an alternative nation? You're God's very own possession. And as his people, you show others the goodness of God. Who shows the goodness of God? You do. How do you do that? Not by you because you and I aren't that awesome. We do it by witnessing to Jesus. That's what a priest does. A priest never draws attention to the priest. The priest brings the people before God and God to the people. You need to be near God in the assembling and gathering of the church so that you can bring the goodness of God into whatever world you're encountering. You're not gonna save the world, but you can preach Jesus for your world. I don't know about the nation, I don't know about the world, but can we just see our neighborhood? We can complain about the world, but if we're not being priests for our neighborhood, we are missing something. And this is not like an optional opt-in checkbox to your Christian life. It just is who you are. So what are we doing about it? Last verse, Ephesians 1. I'm going to read this in the Message Bible because I just love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Because if you get, if you get, if you read verse 22 and 23 in uh, like a literal translation, it's so beautiful, it's confusing. You notice that sometimes your Bible is just so beautifully written, you don't know what it's talking about. So I just love this, Eugene Peterson paraphrasing this. He, that's Jesus, is in charge of it all. All is all. Has the final word on everything. And at the center of all this, the center of what? Him being in charge of it all and has the final word on everything. At the very center of this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. (laughs) Where does God place the church? At the very center of everything he intends to do for this world. Politics, that's a distant second, third, fourth. Culture, second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, I don't know. Economy, 
second, third, fourth. It's just, it's, no, no, no. The church is what Jesus is up to. He puts, he puts the church as the very center of everything. That's why we need to belong to a church. And if it ain't this church, find a good church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body. Did you know Jesus still has a body? It's his church. In which he speaks and acts. In. In which he speaks and acts. Who is God speaking to and acting for? The church. For what purpose? By which he fills everything with his presence. (laughs) How does God flood all of creation with his presence? To his church. Lord, we need you to save our world, save our country. Lord, we need you in Washington, D.C. Lord, we need you in the political skirmishes slash all-out wars in the world. Is there not problems in the world right now? Are they not major? We need the Lord to act, right? We need the Lord to be present to all of these problems in our country and in our world, right? How did he say he will be present? Through his church. You realize the absence of God's presence in your world isn't on him. It's on you. That's why you need him in you, speaking and acting. We need him. But he's also upon you because his intention of flooding your world with his presence is by flooding you with his presence. This is why we are in such desperate need of his presence. It's not just for us and our good feelings. It's not just for us and good church services. It's because this community desperately needs the presence of God. And he's not going to show up in a glory cloud. He's not going to save the city by a glory cloud. It's going to be his church. And I believe in each of our communities, there are other churches that he's present in and present with. But I'm not responsible for other churches. I'm responsible for this one. We're going to be a church of his presence because we already are priests. And I want us to fulfill that vocation to its fullness being good priests of his presence. The reason why I have such a conviction about this is my five children. My five children, I cannot offload the responsibility of their faith onto the church. I'm responsible for them encountering Jesus. And how are they going to encounter Jesus? Through their parents. And you guys are the bonus. I want them to experience Jesus through you. We are priests. I want us to be good ones. And, it, and, and we are in desperate need of his presence to do that well. Because what are we priesting if we're not engaging in his presence? And I don't, I don't know how to communicate with such conviction how important this is, I think. That like the days of kind of opting in for bonus points in the Christian faith, this, that's over. Our discipleship, our belonging, it's, it's gotten to the point of being non-negotiable because saving the country and saving the world, Jesus has already chosen a method. He fulfilled what his part was. It is finished. His ongoing work is through the Holy Spirit. And how does the Holy Spirit work? In and through the body of of Christ. That's how important you are. You're so important that you are a core strategy of how God floods all of creation with his presence. A tiny, small little fragment of his presence is manifested in and through you for your world. And if enough believers and followers of Jesus totally give themselves to that, eventually the world is flooded with his presence. Amen.